when I was coming up in the music industry, black men working as an executive were non-existent when I was coming up. And I was dealing with middle class white people that had gone to university and had got the job through connections, nepotism, mates. It was a boy, it was a friend's boys club. And, um, and I was from West London and moved differently. Our sponsors for the perspective, Fireway Pizza are offering you guys 20% off using our discount code AD20. Use it today, man. Save money, be patterned. We got you. AD20, Fireway Pizza. I want to say good afternoon to a pioneer, Mr. Darkest Beast. How you doing, sir? I'm blessed to be here and thank you for the time. Um, and the questions that are about to come. Do you know what? I've, I've said this story to you in person, I mean, on the phone, and I was like, I first met you in person. I used, you were like a hologram, like a myth. Like, you know what I mean? It's like Kaiser Sose, right? Yeah. And I remember you were walking up the stairs, and I was like, that's darkest. And I remember, I think must, maybe there was a music week, right? This is so many, maybe 10 years ago, right? And I know people, man, they weren't really reading these things. And I've always had a fascination of who's behind the scenes and such and such and such. And um, you're walking out, it's like you just, you just, you just, it's like you float, you glide <laughs> in, you glide out. <laughs> and um, it was Encore, Encore would do it. Yeah, 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 uh, I remember Encore. Uh, showcase. And I was like, are you, are you darkest beast? And you're like, depends who's asking. Do you know what I mean? That was my line, yeah. <laughs> and I just kept thinking like, the way that you just cut through it was it was inspiring to me because you weren't trying to be like front facing of in the, especially in the position you were in it's like you were just like you was like in and out um so i just wanted to share that that was my first interaction but just to that point why did you move like that within in my perception in in the industry why were you kind of like you know like in um i think it was i i I always I knew early on that if you pop your head above the parapet too soon, it can get shot off. And um, uh, and people that moved with a lot of confidence and used to talk the game, um, uh, and and got paid, got remunerated because people thought they were. The thing, and then a year later, you would see that where's so and so, and it's because people talk too much and took too much, and as soon as they hit the wall, they were moved out. So I always knew that um, um, today you could be hot and tomorrow cold. It, it's you can go from hot to cold easily, and um, and and I had seen that enough times that I wasn't gonna embarrass myself. So. And your, 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 how you move should speak, should speak for itself. And you, there's a bit of, there's a bit of what my brand was, like what was my brand, right? And so I think that there's, there was a bit of um, me trying to shape what Darkest was in the music industry. And I'm not talking as in the third person to be a dickhead. But I've soon found out that that darkest and this darkest now are two different people. Um, um, yeah, because it's, uh, you know, you have to, you know, people talk about authenticity and, and, and being um, the authentic self. I had to find contrived authenticity. Um, uh, um, so what would that mean, though? Because people probably wonder what that means. Um, I suppose it's kind of um, it's just good marketing, right? Um, as a when I was coming up in the music industry, you know, black black men working as an executive were non-existent when I was coming up, so, and I was dealing with middle class white people that had gone to university and had got the job through connections nepotism mates it was a boy it was a friend's boys club and um uh and and i was from west london and moved differently um and if someone pissed me off 
I would pick up a chair and dash it, which nearly happened. But then I caught myself and it was the first time I kind of caught myself as a young black man walking, working in a corporate thing going, you can't behave like this, all right? And um, so you, you kind of, you can, it's that saying, you can, take, you can take the boy out of the street, but you can't take the street out of the boy kind of way. And, um, and you, you learn, you can learn quickly or learn the hard way. And, um, and I learned the hard way um, because when someone, this, when, when I felt that I was being um, talked down to and I wasn't being allowed to do something, it was actually sign an act, which I had no place wanting to sign an act because I was still early in my development. But the way I thought I was being talked to was like, what are you talking to like that? And acted, and, and then I started to act like I, where, where I was from. And, and I remember the managing director coming down who I loved, who I love to this day, Mark Moreau. And he probably heard all the drama from upstairs because his office was just above where we were. Um, and I was like, you know, he came down, he said, what's wrong? I said, well, if Julian doesn't let me sign this act, Julian was my boss at the time. Another guy who was beautiful and taught me how to make records. But he said, I, he said, Julian won't let me sign this act. And if he doesn't let me sign it, I'm going to walk out. And Mark looked at me and he went, opened the door and he went, well, there's the door. And I stupidly walked through it. I stupidly walked through it. Um, and I remember walking through reception, getting out to the street, and it was a warm September afternoon. Um, and I remember looking, turning around, and going, I've just walked myself out of Ireland Records because I was just being an ignorant dick. Um, and then from that day on, which would have been, that was 91, I got back in 94 to Ireland. Um, from that day on, I said, I'm never, ever getting fired again. You see with those situations happen, yeah? Um, were there any, like, in, what was the office complexion like at that time? Were you the only black face in there, in, in the A&R department, or were there others? Um, Come thinking, like, you know, like, sometimes... I was the only black person. Because, you know, sometimes, like, for example, when I worked in a city... Like when we'll go to lunch, it's like there'll be like four of us, and it's like it's so evident, it's like just the four black guys and girls are going. Like we'll go KFC and they're going somewhere else, and it's just like, but so no one, there was no, not not the cultural connection wasn't necessarily there, and how you may have felt and how other people may have felt was. was I didn't. Really I didn't have. Go, I. I didn't have a go-to. There was no go-to in terms of the conversation of yo, we're in the same boat. Like we've come from the same place. There was. There was none of that. Um, and then there was, you know, there was people that didn't, that, that I worked with that never had black friends in their life. Didn't have black friends in their life, didn't have black people in their life. Came from the, came from the country where, grew up where there was no black people. Um, went to school where there was probably no black people and had no black friends and never went into a black household because they had mates. So when you're dealing with that, right? Um, in isolation by yourself. In a way. Yep, yep. Absolutely. Um, so, and that's it. And you just got to navigate it. You just got to navigate the, the, the stress of it. And you don't even, and because it, because it's normal for us, because it's normal, you normalize it. Um, and, um, and, and, and then it takes the edge off you because you're trying to mask and the edge is, I would never let someone take the piss or I'd never let someone say that, um, or I'd have let my emotions get the better of me. So you're, you're finding that you're trying to put a lid on stuff all the time um, and you can't express yourself and you can't express yourself musically because the acts that you sign, um, uh, um, there's no one else signing black acts. So you know you're signing stuff because they go, yeah, it's we're Island Records, it's the optics, you can, you're black. You, but you know no one's sitting there going, um, it's the next best thing or, and it probably wasn't, but, but, you know, I was, I was, you know, I signed this kid called Silent Eclipse, this rapper called Silent Eclipse, the most hardcore rapper you would, I, it was basically my, he, he was what I wanted to be Ice Cube. And we made the records with some of the producers that made the Ice Cube records. And his, his, his song titles were Baptism War on a Satellite or Don't Judge a Book by Its Cover or Government piss off, Parliament spin, ricketing, ticket. So he was dope. 
And that's where I was. I was literally, um, by extension, some of my experts, by extension, what I was trying to do, right, and trying to say. Um, and then you realize that none of them are selling records. Um, and you're sitting in an A&R department with people that have got all of these rock bands that are selling out, the Alley Pally, Brixton Academy, going on tour, um, uh, and doing big stuff. And I'm sitting there with these acts that just about sell out Jazz Cafe and the Subterranea. So I had to be, I had to understand the business, the responsibility of the business and why I was an A&R person. And it wasn't just to satisfy culture or satisfy myself. In, in, in the book, uh, Rebel Records, there's a line where you say, what does success look like from a record label perspective? So pe picking up from that point, you know, you've been a president of labels. What does success look like from a record label perspective? One as an A and R, and then two from the top down as a as a president. There's every label has an A and R budget that allows investment in new artists, and it's there to spend. So the A and R money is there to spend. It's there to um, um, uh, fund the exciting process of new acts and breaking them. And when you break them, um, you create a pipeline of money that's coming back. Um, and uh, while you're spending money out, the act is unrecouped, right? And you're spending... And with, with growing success, you spend more, more money out. But then you create a pipeline of money coming in, all right? That, um, that uh, creates a two-way street of money going out, money coming in. So the, the unrecouped balance fluctuates. Money coming in, earning money, money going back out, losing money, um, um, uh, um, because it's market because you're spending continued spending on marketing, so so a successful artist is you creating a two way stream of pipeline while you're investing, money starts to come back in because of that investment because you're selling you're starting to sell records songs are starting to go, um, and by the end of the campaign, you want to be in recruitment. Now, sometimes you're not in recruitment because sometimes you've had to spend a bit more money, but the artist is, but, but it's still being successful and the money is still coming in. So while you might be a little bit unrecouped, there's still money coming in. So, but as soon as you get into the next option of next, the next option period, more advances, right? Um, uh, um, and start making the record, album two, um, money out advances money out but you're getting income from the first album and the first album might have been successful across Europe and then successful into America where now you've got this steady stream of money coming back in that's actually album one while you're working on album two so and album two is the is usually the album that a lot of people find difficulty on right so you're spending more on album two because you've been successful on album one and you outspend album two outspend album one because it's album two and you're trying to fake chase the success of what you had. So you're spending more money. And all of a sudden you start spending more money than you've got coming back in. And, um, uh, and so album, the sophomore Jinx album starts to impact and starts to soak up your profits from album one because you're creating deficit with album two. Um, so it's about getting to album three, creating um, a catalog, legacy. Um, uh, and if you're in album three, you're probably renegotiating your deal. Um, so yeah, it's about, it's about trying to create an income stream that, um, uh, that if you keep it open, you know, and you go to album two and album two does well and it, then everything starts paying for itself because now you're on album three and you've probably got an international global footprint 
and you're probably selling this amount, amount of tickets around the world. So you have now have a business that's not reliant on one hit that was on the first album that's skewing everybody's brain thinking, oh, we've cracked it and we go to album two, we lose our shit. Sophomore jinx. Fuck. Expensive deals sometimes have the artists or the team lacking confidence. So if you can speak to that and expand on it. If... If you if you if you're betting on yourself and you you have some idea, you might not have the full idea, but you have the some some idea of how you're going to get yourself to market. Um, because record companies don't. That's not a record company's job. Our record, our, yes, we we can go and create and put together flow. You know, uh, you know, should you know, yes, yeah, yeah, stuff can be put together, but in the main, artists that are successful are the ones that are going to figure out whether you're in the room or not. So, in old money, there used to be artists that used to be, you know, get something going and create a buzz, and and in a in a in a world where people used to sell a lot of records, you could kind of get away with, you know, chasing a deal, paying over the odds, and. Um, and it washing its face or it, or it making money. Um, but if someone came to me and said, we're going to do a deal, but we're not going to take any money, I'd be like, why, why can't I give you some money? No, we don't want to take any money. We just want a higher royalty. I, I, you'd rather give them more money than give them a higher royalty. All right? So, you know, they go, no, 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 just, just get a little bit of money, but give me, I want a better royalty on the back end, right? And, um, and, uh, and the less money you take, it's more about the back end. The more money you take, it's front-loaded, right? Um, and so for me, you know, when people take a lot of money, I, 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 I say it's a sign of they're worried that they're not going to get back to the table. And um, so they're going to, you know, the, the, when lawyers negotiate deals, they always negotiate on the fact that something bad is going to happen and that you're going to have to pay people out, right? The, the, the contracts are there to protect the artist, get it? They're there to protect us, but they're always predicated on if it doesn't work. You know, we want a pot of money to spend that. If this doesn't work, we can spend this. So everything's predicated on it not working. And I remember me, when me and Ted were running a label in Mumford & Sons, the kids wanted to sign Mumford and Sons and the deal was 150 grand. And the manager had already had managed Keen had sold us millions of records. So I was like, 100 grand, 150 grand. Yeah, just give us 150 grand. We'll mix and master the record. And, um, and I was like, are you serious? He goes, listen, Mumford and Sons are going to be the biggest thing since sliced bread. And I was like, yeah, all right. And they were. And two years, three years in, we were renegotiating. And I had to give them everything back, everything. Their live, their mer like every bit of business that we negotiated, I had to give it back because, and I remember going, but we fought hard to kind of build this kind of extra 360 business. And, and the chairman, David Joseph, the chairman at the time, he went, how much money has Mumford made Ireland? Millions. Okay, then give them it back. They'll love you for it. We'll continue with it. We'll get the next album. And, you know, so it's when people, you know, Tinchy gambled on himself because he came in with business, you know, Star in the Hood. I remember sitting across from him and going, what's that T-shirt you got? What, this Star in the Hood? I was like, yeah. He's like, yeah, that's my brand. I was like, oh, man, Star in the Hood, that's, that's rolls off the tongue. And I was like, what do you do with those T-shirts? He goes, oh, I mailed, mailed them out. Well, how many do you mail out? Daily, 20, 25, 20, 25. How much are you charging? 20 quid. What? That's a business. So we invested in Tinchy's business, Star in the Hood. We invested. It wasn't a record deal. The record deal was the music, the records, but we invested in Star in the Hood and we took it to Whiteley's. We created the brand, we made um, soft furnishings, like those big bean bags and and it's still a brand that owns, earns in money today. So, you know, you know, you know the people that are going to be successful with you or without you in the room. Right? You, you, um, you, 
you you've just got to, you've just got to back it. But um, uh, yeah, I think you, it's always you know we we over we success has many ma- mothers and fathers, and I think sometimes people overclaim what their role was in it. Can I ask you a question? Yeah, and this is something that um, I consider a lot. So the house always wins, I believe, in, mm-hmm. in, in the record label situation. But in any business, mm-hmm. isn't it right? It has to. It has to. It has a lot of risk capital, so it has to make sure it's yeah, um, it's self covered. When you look at deal structures from a president perspective, yeah, what are the, some some of the things that you kind of ensure that we, from for a company perspective, we need to. Like these are the things that we, unless you are like a superstar, mm-hmm. these are the parameters to which we need to keep, whether it's like um, the royalty rates, because like you said before, you said you'd rather give more money than give the royalties, because obviously on a long-term catalog perspective, it's more money for the company. But mm-hmm. what what do you, what, what was your kind of framework? And was it your own framework? Or was it a framework given to you and said, this is how we... Yeah, I mean, you know, re- record companies need to protect their IP you know as much as people in record people get pissed off at people in record companies they invest someone sometimes blindly in people in music Um, uh, um, and there's there is a framework I you know I can't go bankrupt in the company just because I want to make a stupid move so I have terms of reference that I can do deals up unto a certain amount which I think was like a quarter of a it might have been a quarter of a million what my terms of references were before I had to go upstairs. Um, and, you know, royalties would start, used to start at a kind of, you know, between 18 and 19%. Um, but because of the direction of travel and um, uh, data records and people, you know, that royalty rate got pushed up over the years. And once that happens, you can't bring it back down because there's lawyers and managers going, well, you gave me that before. So, it, you know, where it was at 18 and 19 is probably at 21 and 20 and 21 now until you get to the 23s and 24s, which is a bit rock, rock star royalty. Um, but you know, just say, it feels like those percentages seem really small in terms of difference, but like what they are worth seems like when you're looking at a, a long-term yeah. asset sheet. Oh, no. Well, I get as an A and R, I get. I used to get one percent, and then uh, you know, and then you get two percent um, on the artists that I sign. Is that only for A and R managers then, or do you have to be in a certain position? You, uh, your you, your deal had to once you because not every A and R person or executive goes in on a deal. If you get poached and blah blah blah, um, but. Um, yeah, once once you get into a deal, there you get three year cycle deals, and they um, put you on contract. A thing I want to ask you also is, um, we're going to get into the book. I've, I've been I've been getting into it. Um, I'm really inspired thus far. I want to try and get a few definitions for clarity for people. Like, so we're going to kind of almost reverse engineer. So, Ireland, the highest position you had was president or CEO or CEO mm-hmm. of Ireland. Okay, cool. Um, what is what is that role? What was the remit when you get given that role? I ain't got a fucking clue because I wasn't trained. As much as I'd made it to tops, but I was still kind of on the shop floor. Um, while, even though I couldn't do day to day A and R, I was still kind of in the mix and um, and um, it, it, it's different because David was the CEO of Universal, so he ran the business. Um, and we were the frontline labels, part of the business. Um, and we had to hit the numbers that he, that David then could deliver Universal's business as a whole. When I went to America as president and CEO, the CEO piece was you're managing the business, right? And um, it, it's an important um, uh, role, different to the president. And I remember Lucian saying to me, you know, this is not the same as you being a president in the UK. You know, you are managing the business out here. And, um, and I didn't until I got there. Um, and um, being creative and managing the business. 
that's two sides, different sides of the brain. And I don't have that. I always just had a good number finance person or a good number two that would go, you're spending too much or you're not spending this or you don't have this to spend. Um, but you leave that kind of stuff to me and I'll take the company down. <laughs> like Bearings Bank. But um, um, what is actually the difference though? Like when you say managing the business, yeah, like uh, from a CEO perspective in America, like, like it's probably less creative. Is it more just numbers? It's, it's, is it, it's, is it's it less creative. Reports, and it's, yeah. P&Ls, where we are and just... So yeah. that's, okay, cool. Yeah, it's... it's, it's but because but I was a creative... Um, I didn't have to learn the creative side. I had to learn to have the patience to sit in a room with people talking to me about stuff I had didn't care about um, and um, and look like I cared about. But if you've got the right people in situ, um, even though you have to care about it, you've got other people doing it for you. Um, so yeah, there was the, it was it, it, I I had to learn what that was and I didn't have the patience for it. So in the UK it was different then? It was different. It was, uh, and, and it was different because um, David was our CEO, chairman and CEO. So he was doing that role yeah. and then you ended up having to do in his role yeah. in, a, in America. I, I got yeah. you. On a smaller scale yeah, because sorry. he was running the corporate business but each of the frontline labels were business units. Right? Um, uh, yeah, I, I kind of, you know, it, I was talking about in business units rather than in, as a record label. So that's the different side of the brain, right? And um, and I just was had to make sure that the label hit the number. And um, uh, I remember in COVID, I had a five, everything got blown out because of COVID, release dates, tours, everything. And I had, I had a really busy release schedule that got blown out and had a five million hole in my budget. And I was told by no in certain terms, you are finishing the year um, with a five million hole in your budget. Um, so I had to go and find the money hook or by crook. Um, um, and, you, and you do that by different parts of the business. Catalog helped me a lot. Um, probably did most of the, the legwork for me. Um, but... Um, yeah, in that instance, that's what that was my responsibility to fill that deficit. Would you then have to pull back on signings? Yeah, pull back on signings, um, pull back on market and spend. Market and, spend. Um, and it got, I remember it got really heavy because people don't care that you've got five million. Artists don't care, managers don't care. They use, uh, where's the budget to do this? And I thought we were doing that. And it's like, uh, you know, and then you've kind of, you, you, you so then you're just managing business, yeah. right? Um, and trying to move different bits around the board, <laughs> like, you know what I mean? And it's, um, and I just found that r really stressy because usually I'd find the records and they would get us out of trouble. But did redundancies have to be made in those situations or were people safeguarded? And no, we were, we were, oh God, I mean, I've, 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 had, I've had to manage redundancies. Not in the American business, but in the UK business. Is that difficult? Yeah, it's difficult because you are let, letting go people that you've worked with and that are kind of your work family. But it's it, it's happened because either the business is in a bad way, which you you have nothing to do with. When it becomes, it's hard when you and your team have not delivered and people are getting fired because you didn't. Because that's what happens. Um, so that's why I always used to, my line was trust the A&R process, trust the A&R department. And if you've got a great A&R department, you get, you get a sense of stuff to get behind. You get camaraderie because people are delivering everything. You get a sense of pride because you're delivering. And, and that's where all the excitement and people getting up in the morning going, I'm going to work. In the absence of it, you get this, which is a bit, um, vac is a bit empty and vibeless because nothing's really happening. People are going to work with no results, no acts are breaking, nothing's really moving. And and we the, back in the day, that's that was the juice that got us all going. Well, something's happening here. I can smell it. I can taste it. And people used to kind of just 
be on their toes and but now people know it's not coming anytime soon and if it's coming it's data and they'll be able to see it coming down the road they're not going to bump into something kind of go oh wow what's this this is amazing it's um i can see it because the data is growing and it's and and all of these records are homogenous gloop so um i'm not sitting there going the the world it's the end of the music industry i'm sitting there going burn it and let regrowth happen i know you're not a fan of the terminology data scientists um i didn't even know that these things existed until i was one day in a meeting and um so it was actually universal i was like what do you do he's like, he's like i'm a data scientist i was like I heard it. I didn't know it was real. Some dude had data. I'm a data A&R person. And I was like, get out of my face. Get out of my face. Because data, data, back in the day, data was people chatting. Data was a show selling out. That was more tangible. More tangible. It was more tangible. Yeah. And people so threw out the bathwater with the baby in it. When it, when it came to this data stuff. Because it was to say that no one cares about anything else anymore. And you're literally going to change your whole model because you're not patient of the, of, the, of, of the stuff coming full circle, right? And that people started saying, well, people don't care about albums. People don't care about voices. People don't care about what people got to say. Well, who are you to say that? Who are you to dictate that? So it kind of gets, it's got to get back to, get back to people not dictating and building, building, building exciting communities where you don't know what's going on. And someone has to tell you, yo, go and check that thing that's happening over there in the corner. And you kind of go and you go, wow, wow something's exciting is happening. It's small, but it's exciting. So I, I believe that there's enough people in, 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 in the world that care enough. It always takes just a handful of people to affect thinking, culture, thought. Um, and um, uh, um, and it's still happening on a smaller, a smaller scale. It's just about how the stuff scale up. I think a point of interest, I think, for many people that are watching this would be like, one, not in layman's terms, but somewhat within layman's terms, because like I say, we will like, scale things back to its origins, but how do you even get, one, the job of the president of Island Records, and two, how do you even then get the job as the CEO and president of Def Jam in America? Like, what's the actual, like, fly and all process for that? Um, I've talked to people, and I said, what do you want to do with your life, you know, when people are discussing their, um, their next move or their trajectory or promotion or pay rise? And... Some, pe some people blatantly have said to me, I want to run a label. I want to be president of a record label. I want to do what you do. And I'm glad that people think like that. But I, you know, when I was coming up, there was no one in situ for me to think like that. I had no ambition to, I would never ever thought that I could be entitled enough to think that I could run a label as a black boy in a white setup. So, so all I knew was from, from, from the stories that we talked about, don't get fired, stay in situ which means that you have to kind of build yourself into a, um, um, what's that thing when people always want you around? You become... Indisposable. Indi indis indispensable. Indis indis yeah. Indispensable, yes. Right? Indispensable, yes. And, and, um, and that you have a work ethic that goes beyond everybody else. Right? So, um, and, and do people like you? So when it's not going too well, it's like, it's all right though, it's darkest man, and he's like, you know, and I remember um, there was a key moment and I was getting poached. This was before all of my success, but there was a key moment when um, I was getting poached by EMI. And I went to see Lucian, who was in charge of us. And I didn't really know Lucian at the time. And I said, look, I want to leave. I want to go. To, um, he said, why? I said, I'm being poached by EMI. And he was like, well, how long have you got left on your deal? And I said, four or five months he was like so you can't go anywhere for four or five months so what are you coming to me for and I was like oh shit I'm played this wrong and he's like do you know me and I was like not really he's like well what do you know about me so we went into this kind of real kind of um uh ego thing 
All right. And um, there was there was there was a bit of banter, some bit of, bit of backwards and forwards. And he said, "Tell your lawyer not to call me. You're not going anywhere. Um, and if you want to go on a journey and be successful, um, we might have a conversation when the deal's up." Anyway, my deal well, my deal came up. Lucian wasn't talking to me. Um, and another six months went by and he called me into his office. He said, sorry, before that, what role did you have at that point? I'm oh, sorry. I was an A&R manager. A&R manager. I was an A&R manager. Yeah. Sorry. I beg your pardon. I was an A&R manager. Um, and, um, I remember he gave me a deal and usually you give three year deals. And he said, I'm going to give you a two year deal. And he said, how much, how much do you want? And I might, I don't know what I was on at the time, but I said a number and he went, all right, shake my hand. And I went, okay, well, 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 what about this? He goes, no, 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 no. You said that number, shake my hand. And we shook hands and he said, right. He said, um, he said we're going to go on a journey and you're going to be successful. Um, so I, I, I became successful. Not because I, was, I became a successful A&R person. And with success and re repetition, um, and not just with the same act, but with other artists, your success makes you an asset to the company. You know, I, as soon as, when I signed the Sugar Babes, from then until I left, I paid for my, I paid my way and then some. Like the, the catalog I left at Universal pays for, for, for years. So I've got no issue about that. And I remember saying, you know, always pay your salary out of the success that you're having every year. No one can come for you, right? Because you're not losing money. You're making money. So you become an asset. Um, and so, you, you know, while I had no ambition to run anything, I, I had ambition not to get fired. And I had ambition to sign acts that were as big as these other white A&R people. And then one day I woke up, Sugar Babes About You Now was number one. Back to Black album was number one. So where do you go from there? Right? And when my boss, the MD, left, the president left, um, who were they going to give it to? Now, they could have brought someone over me and Ted, right? They, they could have maybe, and I, they could have given it to me by myself, that would have been a bad move. But he said, let's, let's put Darkus and Ted Cockle together. He was the yang and I was the ying. He was white, I was black. I was music, he was marketing. Um, um, I had culture. He did. <laughs> but but we, we were, the fit was, was so amazing that we went on this run. Right. And so everything was born off the back of just being good and delivering. And um, and some and then people want to reward that with running the company. And um, and then when you're super successful at that, um, people are sitting there going, shit, we're just about to lose the guy that's running Ireland in America. Who are we going to get to do? It? Oh, the dark, dark. What an amazing story that would be. Darkest from the UK. Taken to the US, Pfft, easy. And it goes back to before you said before about like, what is your brand? And now the narrative of who you are can now be transcended to, oh, because I think with, a, with the thing with what I've looked at is the UK has a almost like a procession of like, if you look at all the, the even like in um, Sony, mm -hmm. they're all British based mm -hmm. and they've all gone started from here mm -hmm. and they've gone over there mm -hmm. and then. Like there is like a, mm -hmm. a pathway. So seeing you going over there, I was like, wait, we've never we've never seen a black export like this. So going to America, like, were you were you actually ready for it for that jump? Um, you'd like to think I was ready. Um, you know, I travelled. I'd gone back as I'd been back as a forwards to America for decades through work. Um, you knew the characters that worked in America. Um, you. You've, you've got 25 years plus under your belt here. 
So yeah, I should I should have been ready. I should be ready, right? But you, living in living in America and just popping over there for three days, but living and working and living in America and running a business was completely a different headspace. Um, and you can't find that out until you actually get there. Um, but yeah, there was there was major apprehension about going there. But that's that. What does ambition look like? Like, what if if I said no? You know. It was weird because some people go, why are they sending you to America? Are they trying to get rid of you? And I was like, no, it's a, this is a good thing. This is a promotion. Um, you know, I remember getting, I remember getting the, um, I remember getting the record, I remember getting the deal over what they wanted to offer me. And you know when you realise, oh, that's how much they pay Americans. That's why these, this is why they're so mad. Because... The ability to make the dough in America is real. The, bil- the American dream is real because it's scale. Like you, you can literally go from I'm poor to multimillionaire. It's, 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 and, 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 and it happens right in front of your face while you're there. And so people have this real stab you in the front to get where they need to get to. There's no stabbing in the back. People stab you in the front and look you in the eye and tell you why they're doing it but it's okay and lay you down while you're dying, you know, right? But, um, and here it's more in the back and, um, but, um, but, but yeah, America, the scale of the business, it's intoxicating, it's intoxicating. So, and you're close to the sun, that's where they all are. I mean, you know, yeah, it was just, I would go to the studio and be hanging out with Buster. And I remember, um, I stayed too long in the studio and thought Buster was my mate. You know, it was Buster Rhymes, man. Got his number in my phone. And I remember the next day after the studio, just hearing that they, took, they play everything at flipping, he dialed up to 12, right? And I, remember Lee, and I remember the next day, Buster calling me and going, yo, King, so what's the deal? I'm like, what do you mean, what's the deal? What's the record deal? I played you the music, you know, offered me a record deal. So I got myself into a sticky situation with Buster, right? And he was expecting a record deal to, an offer to come. And I was just, I was just hanging out in the studio. And I remember speaking to the head of legal in America, the legal department. He said, there's one thing you need to learn about, learn about hip hop. If you're not going to do the deal, don't do the meeting. If you don't want to do the deal, do not do the meeting because you will do the meeting and you'll end up doing the deal. So be very careful because these people don't play around, right? And I was like, okay. It's a cultural difference. Here, there's going to be plenty of meetings. Cultural differences. Okay. Um, but yeah, this, every, every, everything is just dialed up and scaled up. Um, and um, I was living in New York, living and working in New York, in New York which was just... Um, a different headspace that if you were living and working in LA, two different, two different paces. America, is, uh, New York is just head down and just relentless, and LA is just like, I'll see you for breakfast at Santa Monica. We have some, we have some muesli and some fruit bowl. Mm-hmm. I'll see you for lunch. But um, yeah, it's um, you know, being good got me to America. I never, I've never asked for a pay rise. I've asked for one pay rise, my first. Never asked for a pay rise, never asked for a deal, never asked for a job. In terms of, in terms of promotion, never asked, never said I wanted to run it, never said I wanted to be CEO. Uh, and maybe muted that, wouldn't it be cool to go and work in America? Imposter syndrome, medicating it with success. So even getting to all these scales, so I, I look at your journey, I was thinking, okay, cool, you started off and when you came into the building, so to speak, there wasn't many like you. You then get to a position within that building where there wasn't another you, and then you go to America, and then no one from the UK. You even like it, it's anomalies, mm. like one of one. Mm. Speak to where and how it manifests the imposter syndrome when you're climbing those ladders. I think that the imposter syndrome, you dial it back to when you're a childhood, right? And it's being told that you're going to amount to nothing. Um, being told that you're just a disruptive influence. Being told that you're, being told that you're, the colour of your skin is not going to get you there where other people are. Um, 
that people don't, if you're on TV, you're a stereotype. So there's all these things coming at you telling with, with negative, with negative impact. But you're just, you're just bowling about your day, but you don't realise the damage that it's doing and you're normalising that stuff. So, you can't, so you, you, you're going through life thinking you're being tolerated. Even in school, you think you're being tolerated. Oh, oh, oh. So you, you think you're being tolerated all the time. And then when you get the job, because a, a, a person that doesn't look like you gave you the job, um, then you, it, they're the gatekeeper to let you in, right? They're the reason why you're going to be successful. They're the, they're, 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 they've chosen you to walk through the door, right? So it's not within your power. So, um, so even when I was at having success, you're thinking, yeah, but was it because I was letting the room or was it because he said something that I then picked up on it and that, is it because of that person? Maybe, maybe it's not because of me. So, and because there's quite a few people in the room and blah, blah, blah. And so it doesn't, it, it, even, even now I have a, a scintilla of it, right? Um, but the writing of the book and the laying it all out and you kind of go against the backdrop is only in the last three years since I've started writing a book and probably in the last year and a half that I've gone, I just need to be American about this and go, yo, I did this, right? And, um, and, uh, and that the book should have a sense of, of, um, uh, ownership on dude like you know when people people used to but when people talk say oh dude like let people it's other people that use the word legendary it's other people that use these 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 adjectives i don't i don't use them but they then end up building you up into this thing that you go i didn't call myself this i didn't call myself legendary what do you mean you're legendary i didn't call myself legendary someone said why do you want to write the book i didn't want to write the book so how did you become CEO? I didn't want to be CEO. So I just wanted to be successful. I just wanted to be good at what I did. Um, and, and by extension of that, I got all the pressure that comes with it. The pressure, pressure bus pipes, burnout, um, breakdowns. In your journey, have you visited those dark places? And what does that look like? And what was the catalyst for those? Um, sustainability. What's sustainable? Um, at, at the level I was and the job that I was doing, um, it wasn't sustainable. And um, then you have... So you have you 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 have just the pressure the the daily burn of work and um, there's only so much the human mind and the human body can talk after thirty years. I'm talking about myself specifically of going at it day in day out. There's 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 a lot you have to give up if you're gonna be, if you, to be that as successful I I was or or even more as other people are you have to give up so much um, that you don't realise that you're giving up because you think you're present, but you're not. Um, um, you think you're, you're, uh, you're across everything, but you are, but you're not. Um, it's whether, you know, people come for your neck in different ways, all right? And, um, and uh, you know, whether it's the executive or the artist, um, uh, um, when you when you look at I've worked with a lot of people and I've had artists and managers and staff that have all had breakdowns that have all um, uh, are having are in depression having anxiety can't work um, and um, uh um, and even though there's always been a lot of pressure, the way the world is going at the moment in terms of volume, everyone wants volume. 
So there's so much more that people have to do. You have to be on all the time. That's that's crazy. Um, um, and and you have to be relentless um, uh, and be successful. I just don't know how all of those things um, uh, are sustainable. Um, so when, you know, for me, it, um, a lot came out of my diagnosis where I was diagnosed with ADHD and um, I'd, like last year, I, um, I got diagnosed with ADHD and social anxiety, which, um, which made me realize that I was walking around depressed and didn't know about it for years, all right? Um, um, but because you're just so locked into this thing, you just go and you go and you go and you go, that when the world does actually slow down and stop like we did in COVID, um, it's like slamming on the brakes and not having your seatbelt on, right? And just smashing through the window and out onto the street and just kind of going, Shh, not, you know, where um, um, uh, where everything is just caught up with you. And um, uh, yeah, I started smoking a lot more to slow stuff down um, and then smoking too much um, where it was just a fog. Um, and as a man and as a black man, I was like, Lao therapy. I'm just wired differently. Um, but then it got a bit of crisis management. Yeah, it got a bit of crisis management. And, um, and uh, I ended up seeking therapy in America. And um, uh, that opened up a whole door. And then I got diagnosed with ADHD, which said, you're walking around with a lot of baggage um, because ADHD doesn't just turn up, right? There's a bit of, um, there's, uh, there's underlying traumas linked with it. Um, and that went back to my childhood. That went back to the 70s and 80s. You know, a lot of people were angry at the time. Um, uh, domestic violence was a thing. Um, there's a lot of stress and anger at the time. Um, uh, so it, a lot of that was linked. So when I realized that I had, I'd been diagnosed and I'd just been relentlessly just pushing on and you, you know, it affected my family because you think you're present, but you're not present, you know, and my son got diagnosed with ADHD. That's how I got diagnosed. All right. So, um, and my daughter got diagnosed. So, you know, I was like, shit, my DNA, man. I'm just, it's, um, but um, it's, um, but yeah, so it, it, that's why the book was so important for me in terms of you can take the music as the backdrop, which makes it, you know, when, you, when you're filming a, a feature film and the, 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 the set, the set is, 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 is is the star of the show you know the music business is the star of the show i get it it's a it's an interesting backdrop but it is it is literally the journey of a black boy and all the baggage that comes with it right because even in a world where you had you know lgbtq and me too um i'm like and 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 black women and bl black gay people can fall into those things but us Young black men, we're vilified. Um, uh, uh, we're 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 almost we're almost built up to be savage. Um, um, people are scared of us. Young black men, people are scared of us, and we're told we're told where we're going to end up. Um, we we people can see outside their window what their world looks like. Um, so for me, it's not even about, you know, how can someone be the best plumber and have a career being a carpenter? Cause it's not just about the, the, the book is not about the music. That was just, I was lucky to be in it. The book is about, can we navigate life? What does having something sustainable, you know, what's the, remember when we used to, you know, 
because you used to, we grew up with when people that used to have a job for life and you could buy it and you could buy a house and yeah. have your children and that was like that was our fam that was like you know you go around your mate's house and dad was you know the taxi driver and mum would come home from work and that was a job for life and you had that but now it's all or nothing there's no in between so you know people are either in famine or they've got too much there's no middle class I can just get on and you know, so it's, um, so I just want, I just, I don't want young black men. Who's moving the needle for them other than locking them up or, 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 um, or having some charities that help them as they come out of prison or um, what's the, what's the conversation where you can say to young black men, you're in trauma, you're undiagnosed you've got ADHD or you've got Asperger's or you're autistic. Um, it's a lot of autistic people in the music industry. Yeah. yeah, a lot, yeah. But, but, but a lot of people that kind of get that therapy, I've been told, offend less, that get, that get told that there is, you're wired differently. You're not a bad person. How isolating was it being in that position? Because like, like, none of us, are, corporate ladder-wise, music industry-wise, haven't scaled that high. But for you, how isolating was it? It was super isolating because everybody's calling you for something. Everybody. Everybody. No one's calling you not for nothing. Everybody's calling you for something. Whether it, whether you're in campaign with something, whether someone wants a deal, whether someone wants promotion or someone wants a job, I can give the music industry. I can change someone's life. I can sign them. I can drop them. I can give someone a job. I can take the job away. That's, that was, you know, that's, um, and, and are you, you go play, you couldn't go places cause you'd drop someone and you, 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 so, and you didn't, you know, so if you've been around long enough, you create enough, enough scenarios where it's just, oh, I can't go over there, man, just, I just dropped that person and, or I'd let that person go. So, or I don't want people asking me for something and, you know, because, some someone wants always wants something from me when I was running the label again to repeat whether it's a record deal whether it was a job whether it, whether it was CDs for a charity whether it's tickets is I used every day it was you just felt people just taking 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 to, and you, and you had to be this giving person um, and and it was different and you had to be different in different rooms. And you had about 20 tabs open. And there's different genres, different parts of the business. Um, black people, white people, brown people, gay people, straight people. And you've got to have everybody feel that they're getting something from you. Um, uh, and um, uh, you, you, you don't create a two-way street because it, it, you, you, you don't want to create a two-way street relationship because you get too into it with people. Um, and there may be a time we may have to cut off that. And, and, and then it's hard because you've created this thing. So I was very, I was always very mindful of, um, um, but could, I could give people the real as well. I would try and always give people the real that when shit did go down, I, either, you, I, I could still have a conversation, but p sometimes people just don't want to hear what they don't want to hear. Um, and, I, and that wasn't right all the time. You can't, you can't be. So um, there's some people that, you know, I would have rubbed up the wrong way. And I was at, um, I was at my book launch yesterday and an artist came along. And, um, and apparently that artist thought I was a dickhead for a long period of time. And it wasn't until recently, you know, where, you know, when there's enough time passed and you kind of go to, to the point, shit, your, your job must have been hard. You know More I mean? of empathy now. Absolutely. You know, because I literally, if I, I, I would get called to sell out by my own people. And that's mad from the background that you've come from. Mm. Your dad being a mm. Black Panther, like, you're, like mm. you're true to mm. your roots and culture. People would call me a sellout. Um, I'm a pretend black man. Um, I, would, I, 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 would, I would literally get that at the same time when I was trying to navigate shit with my white counterparts. So when you talk about isolation, 
You know what I mean? It was, if I went to culture, black culture, it'd be like, but are you from the culture though? And I'd be like, no, I came through a different way. I came through back in the day when there was no culture, you motherfucker. <laughs> All right, sorry for the, for the no. thing. But I came through a different way. So um, uh, a lot of people see me as part of the white establishment because I came up before there was culture. Okay, it's like you just, and you were just were there when, and it, I was appeared, there. when it appeared. So uh, you had to be a part of it. Right, so, you know, that was, um, people thought I was grew up, people thought I was middle class and rich. I was like, back in, you know, and I was like, you don't, even white people were like, you ain't from the hood, you don't know no black people. And I was like, I will get your ass spanked from all across West London. So, but because, like I said, I, 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 I masked, I spoke a different way. Um, I, could, I could go and hang out with the made of types. You know what I mean? And, um, and um, the, 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 the groovy Labra Grove people as well as the Mandem. Um, so, um, yeah, it was, it, was, it, was, it, was pro it was seriously isolating. 